Hello everyone, uh, I'm Dr. Redwan Cassini, a mechanical engineering professor at the University of South Florida in Tampa, Florida. Uh, in this course here, we're going to talk about robot kinematics, uh, which includes kinematics, uh, forward kinematics, inverse kinematics, uh, Jacobian, and so forth. Uh, the textbook we're going to be using is Introduction to Robotics, Mechanics and Control. Uh, we're going to use the fourth edition. Earlier editions would still work, but you know the homework problems might be a little different, and there might be some uh, some difference also in programming. Uh, this is uh, uh, authored by Jean Craig, uh, and we're going to be using this textbook for the most part. Um, uh, in the, throughout the whole course, but there are also some other segments of the course that would not be uh, covered in this book. So uh, I always advise you to look at the uh, videos and make sure that all the topics that you need um, are taken from the video and then use the textbook for reference uh, if needed. I'd like you to talk about a few important things that I want you to know or prepare ahead of time before you start this course. Uh, we already talked about the textbook, Introduction to Robotics, Mechanics and Control, 4th edition, by Jean Craig. Um, and the ISBN number is shown here. You can find it in Amazon or any other bookstore of your choice. Uh, programming, uh, we're going to be using MATLAB release 2020A. Uh, this is the version that I, I've used here for uh, this course, throughout the course. Uh, and we'll also be using Robotics Toolbox Release 10.4. Uh, this toolbox is designed by Peter Cork, uh, and you can go to his website uh, and download it for free. Once you download it, you can install it or add the toolbox to MATLAB toolboxes. Now, some of the commands might be different between these releases and other releases uh, earlier or later, uh, but it's also always good to look at the uh, syntax of any um, commands or uh, programming uh, functions uh, to make sure that it's consistent and compatible with any version different than these. Uh, so we're going to be using this for simulation and, and programming uh, throughout this course. Uh, it's always a good idea to get it together, uh, install it, get familiar with it before you start the course and, and its contents. Uh, the goals of this course is to understand the science and engineering of mechanical manipulation. Uh, from the perspective of kinematics. Uh, we're not going to be talking about dynamics. Uh, all, the whole course is talking about kinematics, but we will talk slightly about uh, velocities and forces as well in Chapter 5. Uh, the needed background for this course includes basics, statics, and dynamics, just the basics. A linear algebra that includes uh, matrices, multiplying matrices, inverting matrices and so forth and some higher level programming which might include just you know knowing the uh, flow charts of how to make programs and how to make loops and so forth uh, we'll also be using MATLAB um, students will be using that for homework and project uh, so make sure that you're familiar with MATLAB as well uh, if you have some introductory course uh, in controls that would be an added bonus but it's not really necessary now, for the first chapter, we're going to have some background, and at the same time, I'm going to brush up on uh, some of these information that you might have forgotten, uh, including linear, linear algebra, um, matrix operations, multiplications, inversions, and so forth. Uh, I'm going to be also talking a little bit about uh, trigonometric functions that we're going to be using for this course. So if you're not really familiar with this, these backgrounds, we're going to you know, talk about it briefly uh, in chapter one as a review. Uh, the topics that will be covered in this course include, after the introduction, include spatial descriptions and transformations, uh, manipulator kinematics, which would be forward kinematics, and then inverse kinematics, uh, and that would be the opposite of the forward kinematics. And then we're going to talk about Jacobian, that includes velocities and static forces. And then finally, we're going to talk about trajectory generation, uh, which is actually needed. So, so I will jump. Uh, into trajectory generation before covering Jacobian because we need these for a simulation before we talk about Jacobian. So I'll do the trajectory generation first and then go back to the Jacobian uh, velocities and static forces. Uh, throughout the whole course, we're going to be talking about programming and simulation. Uh, each chapter will have um, some segment of programming uh, so that we can cover 
any relevant information about programming for uh, the particular chapter we're talking about. Okay, starting here with chapter one, introduction and review. Uh, the summary for this chapter is uh, basically to learn some background about industrial robots and a brief summary uh, of the course contents that uh, we're gonna cover in this course uh, and even more. Uh, so we're gonna talk more about also the uh, topics that are covered in, uh, in the textbook. And then we're gonna do uh, some review on matrix operations uh, and some trigonometric uh, functions as well. Uh, that will be needed for this course. Uh, the learning objectives for this chapter include learn about historical sales and use of robots uh, throughout history, and then learn about the topics that are covered in this uh, reference textbook. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about a few topics, uh, both the chapters that we covered and the chapters that we will not cover. And then learn about matrix operations which include addition, subtraction, multiplication, and inversion of matrices. Uh, so we're going to talk about these things in this chapter so you can uh, review these and, and brush up on, on them. And finally, we're going to learn, learn more about uh, useful trigonometric identities that we'll be using throughout this course uh, while we're, uh, we're conducting each one of the chapters. I'm going to go through some charts that show some history of robotics and the use uh, in North America. Uh, so this uh, chart here shows the estimated sales of industrial robots in North America in millions of dollars. And as you can see here, there's a trend of increasing use uh, of robots um, starting from the economic depression back in 2008-2009 uh, time period. So that shows how the industry is turning into robots and automation. Uh, to do some, some of the manufacturing. We can also see similar trend here for the yearly installations of multipurpose industrial robots. And the same trend happens here as well. Uh, if you can see how um, every year uh, the number of installations increase um, and, and the use that, that shows that the use of robots uh, and interest in robots is increasing every year. Uh, this chart here shows the estimated labor cost percentage of savings from adoption of industrial robots in 2025 in the future. And it's based here on the country, um, and each country has different percentage of savings. Uh, a lot of these jobs that are lost uh, due to automation and uh, robotics usually are low-paying, uh, low-skills jobs. And uh, most of the time they're replaced you know, through another industry that requires high-paying, a uh, high skilled labor force uh, that would design these robots, maintain the robots, program the robots, and so forth. So yes, some, some jobs might be lost, but other jobs in other industries have also been created uh, with this trend. This figure shows a modern seven degree of freedom robotic arm uh, from KUKA. Uh, and this robot has been used in industry. It's also been used in research um, and a lot of research uh, labs use these robots to conduct the research. Now let's talk a little bit about the uh, course and what's covered in the book, in the textbook. Uh, some of the topics that I'm going to talk about here uh, are covered in this course and some of them are not covered, but they exist in the textbook, uh, the reference textbooks that, that we have. Uh, so one thing here, uh, the first thing we're going to talk about a description of position orientation. And typically in a robotic arm like this, we attach frames to the arm and to the objects uh, and to the ground. Uh, and then we try to define these coordinate frames uh, relative to each other. Uh, this way we can do some controls and we can do some uh, motion uh, to move one of these uh, coordinate frames into the other coordinate frame using the robotic arm. Now in forward kinematics of manipulators, uh, we usually use kinematic equations to describe the tool frame or the gripper, uh, or sometimes we call it the end effector. Uh, so we describe this frame relative to uh, the base frame uh, as a function of the joint angles. So if I would like to describe where the end effector in XYZ and rotation about XYZ relative to the ground frame, I can describe this in terms of theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, and all the joints uh, in my robotic arm. So we call this forward kinematics. Now in inverse kinematics, it's the other way around. Uh, if I need to have or to go to a specific uh, location uh, that includes position and orientation in space, 
relative to the base. Uh, what inverse kinematics does is it finds out what are the joint angles needed uh, that would take the end effector or the tool to that point that you described. Okay, so it's the other way around. Inverse kinematics, we are given the end effector or the tool position, location, uh, both position and orientation, and we need to find the joint angles uh, or the joint values that would take the robot arm or the end effector to that point. This is called inverse kinematics. Uh, for velocities, static forces, and singularities, uh, typically we have to find a matrix called the Jacobian matrix, uh, which basically uh, builds a relationship or has a relationship between uh, joint velocities of the robot and the Cartesian velocities, both linear and angular Cartesian velocities of the tooltip or, or the end effector. So that relationship between these two different velocities is called the Jacobian. Uh, the Jacobian is also uh, a, a relationship between static forces, the static forces that are affecting the joint um, forces and torques, and uh, the Cartesian forces and torques that are acting on the end effector uh, or the tooltip uh, in the Cartesian space. Uh, so both of these relationships, uh, both velocities and static forces, are related by uh, the Jacobian uh, between the Cartesian end effector and uh, the joints. And the Jacobian, a lot of times, can get singular, uh, whether momentarily or uh, permanently. Uh, and the singularity, of course, has to be resolved uh, because it makes you uh, lose a degree of freedom and lose one kind of motions that you can do um, otherwise. So we're going to talk more about this on Chapter 5 uh, and discuss all these relationships and singularities. Uh, this is a small example on singularities. Uh, as you can see here in World War I biplane with a pilot and a rear gunner, uh, you can see how the rear gunner is trying to shoot another plane. And he's using this mechanism for the gun. It has two degrees of freedom. Uh, one degree of freedom is the elevation that goes uh, this way, up and down. And the other one is the azimuth uh, that rotates the gun right and left. So imagine once the gun is upwards, straight vertical, uh, at that particular moment, no matter how much you move the azimuth right or left, the gun will still be pointing upwards, uh, which means that at that particular moment you are at a singularity. You lost that degree of freedom, the azimuth degree of freedom. No matter how you move it, the gun will still be pointing in the same direction. Uh, of course, singularities are not a desirable feature, and we're going to look at chapter 5, how we can avoid uh, singularities and uh, try to get rid of this problem. Uh, now, the relationships between the torques of the joints or forces of the joints, if we're talking about linear joints, uh, the relationship between these torques and forces uh, compared to the motion at the end effector uh, are related through dynamic equations. Uh, now, here we are not assuming static equilibrium. We're assuming that there is a motion. Uh, we're assuming there is mass. Um, so these dynamic equations are relating uh, the torques and the motion at the end effector uh, during the motion. Uh, so, you know, this particular chapter is not included in this course, but it's part of your textbook if you are interested in looking more into this. Uh, for trajectory generation, whenever we want to move the end effector from point A to point B, uh, we always have to create a trajectory for the end effector, uh, whether it's linear or nonlinear non trajectory. Um, and then uh, also for each one of the joints, we have to create a trajectory for the joints. Uh, and if we follow these trajectories for these joints, the end effector should be following its own trajectory. So we're going to talk about trajectories of joints and trajectories of end effector uh, in chapter 7 of this course. Uh, whenever we try to design a robotic arm or a manipulator, uh, there are many factors that we have to take into account to design our robot. Uh, some of these uh, parameters include the, the choice of the actuator, whether it's um, a revolute actuator, linear actuator, uh, what kind of encoders, and, and so forth. Uh, and then where are we going to put the actuators, where the locations are uh, within our robot. And then once we decide the location, how we're going to transmit the power from the actuators to the joints. Uh, we also have to look at the stiffness of the joints, uh, and we have to look at uh, the sensor locations that we're going to sense and send feedback to the motors 
uh, and then these locations are also important and and uh, you know other things that would be taken into consideration are uh, the electronics that are going to power uh, these motors uh, and the logic that would be running through these electronics uh, so this is a chapter that we're not going to cover in this course but you know some of this information is included in the textbook and you can refer to that uh, for more information uh, when we would like to control the robotic arm to follow a specific trajectory that we specify uh, we call this position control uh, you would like the robotic arm or the end effector to move uh, specifically um, within that trajectory that you specify uh, so that desired trajectory has to be uh, implemented uh, and designed first and then you can do position control uh, to go through that trajectory that you designed uh, on the other hand, uh, if we would like to have some force control, for example, as you see here, um, we have to use something called the hybrid position force control system, where uh, the robot arm can still move along the surface here, and at the same time it will be applying constant force so that it does not detach from that surface. Um, so, so that constant force, along with the motion along the surface, would result on a motion that you are not specifying the trajectory for. Uh, you're rather uh, just having the robot move along the surface and apply that force so that it can follow uh, the surface uh, line. Uh, so this is called force control uh, and it's a hybrid between position and force uh, that would be supplied to the robot uh, to move along uh, the line or the surface. Uh, robot programming includes a description of desired manipulator and effector motion uh, and the desired contact forces uh, and some complex complex manipulation strategies. Uh, for example, if you see at this, you know, picking a screw from uh, this box, inserting the screw in a hole and then screwing it in requires a lot of complex programming uh, that would require uh, trajectories, forces, uh, and, and some strategies that you have to, uh, to implement so that the, the complete task can be done uh, using the robot. Offline programming and simulation. Uh, sometimes you are required or you need to do some programming offline uh, where you do not connect to the robot or you don't have access to the robot uh, during the programming. Uh, and sometimes you do verification of your codes and programs through simulation. And once you verify everything is working theoretically good uh, through simulation, then you can connect your program to the robot and run the program uh, into your robot. Uh, so this is called offline programming, um, and you can use that, uh, most likely you know, people use that to develop the program and debug and test the program uh, so that they don't you know, put any harm into the robot or people around the robot. Uh, 